it is the creator who decides the function or the use of his creation. Would we agree with that? It is the creator who determines the function of his creation. Now I think we basically would. But there are times that the creation is misused for a, pur for a purpose that is far less than what it is supposed to do. Let me give an example. The Swiss Army Knife was created by Carl Essener, uh, and it was uh, later on his company was named as Victory Knox. Why Victory Knox? Because his mother's name was Victoria, and the other name for stainless steel is Inox. Okay, so it became Victory Knox. And so the Swiss Army Knife uh, is a very useful tool. It's uh, used not only for the military, it's not only for outdoorsmen, but it's also used for by ordinary people like us. And this knife originally was developed to help the soldiers of the Swiss Army in opening their canned goods and also in disassembling and reassembling their guns or their rifles. Because back then, before the existence of the Swiss knife, uh, the way to open canned goods was they had to use their the bayonet, the knife okay, that was attached to their rifle. So can you imagine how hard it was to open a can of food? Now today, the knife has evolved and it includes additional tools like corkscrew, okay, a saw and file, some versions have the magnifying glass, then for those who forget their dental floss, there's the toothpick at the side. And of course, there's the tweezer. And some versions even have the USB drive on it. And then of course, they came up recently with something that doesn't look like a knife, but looks like a credit card called the Swiss card. And so it's a very functional tool, a very functional knife. It's useful for people like us and for our people who serve in the military. Now one thing we must know, when Carl Essener designed the Swiss knife, he never intended for it to be used for crime or for killing people. So it was very disturbing when I read this article. This just happened last year, October 31. And it happened in San Antonio, Texas. A 22-year-old man stabbed to death a 26-year-old man using a Swiss Army knife. Now, Carl Essener's creation of a handy utility knife was supposed to be for good. It was supposed to be something that was useful, beneficial for mankind. But what happened was that it was marred. The creation was marred by the misuse of one man. Today we continue our study of 1 Corinthians, but we are actually moving a chapter backward. And we will discover that the Corinthian believers have a problem with regards to the issue of function. Especially uh, with the issue of what is the function of our physical bodies. Because they were asking the question, what is our body for? But they were getting the wrong answers from their surroundings. And so this morning, we're going to look at a problem that is prevalent in society back then and even till today. And today, just like during the time of Paul, this problem was something that was widely accepted and tolerated by society. And it, it, not, it, it wasn't just something that was tolerated in society. The bigger problem was that it had infiltrated the Corinthian church and it is still infiltrating the churches today. And this problem is the problem of sexual immorality. Now this issue is not a new problem. It has been around since the fall of humanity into sin. But the sad thing is that it affected the church back then, and up to today, it is affecting the church. A Christian dating site in the US came up with a disturbing report uh, regarding the Christian's attitude toward premarital sex and cohabitation. According to this survey, 
it says that 61% of young Christians, okay, they said that they would have sex before marriage. Uh, by the way, this survey was done in the U.S., okay, but it's very disturbing. It says 61% said they would agree to have sex before marriage. And then 56% said it is appropriate to live together before marriage. Now, I want you to take note. It, it was a Christian dating website that conducted a survey, and they conducted the survey among people who profess to be believers. Now, this statistic, although it reflects the mindset of the young, of the young people in America, it does not mean that the church here is immune. In fact, it does not mean that it will never happen in a congregation like ours. And the, the person who was responsible uh, partly for the survey, okay, named Philip Peter Sprig, he said the following, he said, Christians are perhaps more influenced by the culture than they are by the teachings of Scripture or the church. That is the problem today. Christians, people who profess that they are followers of Jesus Christ, are more readily influenced by the world than by the teaching of the Bible or by what the church stands for. And he made this comment when he was talking about sexual immorality within the church. And it is a very sad commentary. You see, we have abandoned the life-giving teachings of scripture and instead we have chosen to follow a sin-filled world that is our problem now let me share again a bit about the background about the uh, church in Corinth and about the city of Corinth as we move into our study as I've mentioned a couple of times already Corinth was the center of the worship of the goddess Aphrodite uh, Aphrodite is the Greek goddess of love. The Roman equivalent is Venus. Now, Aphrodite is known not only as the goddess of love, but she was also known as the goddess of beauty and sexuality. And according to Greek mythology, Aphrodite had many lovers among gods and men, even though she was already married to another god named Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire and volcanoes. And I mentioned before also that prostitution was widely practiced in the temple of Aphrodite. They said that there were around 1,000 shrine prostitutes who plied their trade inside the temple. And it is highly possible that there were many prostitutes in the streets of Corinth also. It was a common sight. Because prostitution was legal in the city, there was no law against its practice. And because of their worship of the goddess of sexuality and the legality of prostitution, people had this very loose attitude about sex. And this loose attitude was being brought by the believers into the church. And then they would justify their actions by saying two statements, the two statements that we read earlier, which goes like this, everything is permissible, and the second is food for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And so how did Paul deal with the church regarding this particular problem of sexual immorality? And what important truths or principles can we derive from our study this morning? I'd like to suggest five things. The first thing that Paul tells the church is that you have to reject the worldly philosophies with regards to the issue of sex. As I mentioned just a, just a few seconds ago, the Corinthians gave two excuses for their immoral behavior. And these two excuses stem from the issue of law and the issue of Design. Now, for them, as long as the law allows for sexual immorality, then it is permissible to commit immorality even as a believer in Christ. That was 
the first world view that they have. And then second, they reason that the body is designed for physical pleasure, just as the human stomach is designed for taking in and enjoying food. And that was why they were probably asking questions like, why wait for marriage? Or why stick to only one partner? Or why control yourself? And so Paul had to refute both of these arguments. First, he said that what is permissible or allowed by the law is not always beneficial. Our freedom to act may not bring any benefit to us at all. Here in our country, there is no law, no law that prohibits premarital sex, no law that prohibits cohabitation. But the question is, is there any benefit for those who practice it? Uh, just two days ago, the Supreme Court of the United States has finally spoken and they said that same-sex marriage is now legal in all the states, all the 50 states of the United States of America. Now, yes, it is now a law, it is now legal. But the question is, is it beneficial? Will it really be to the advantage of people? Will it really bring blessing to the people? Now, let me list down some of the advantages of having premarital sex. We say that we have the freedom to do it, but then there are some there are many downsides to it. And I'm just listing some of them. First, you have unwanted pregnancy. And then there is sexually transmitted diseases. Then there's the emotional problem of broken hearts. You know, when you, when you feel that you have just been simply used by someone. And then, of course, you become the object of rumors and gossip. Especially when you become, you know, when you become pregnant and then, you know, everyone starts talking. And then the various emotional issues that are hidden that will surface later on, the trauma, all of those things. But then, uh, most serious of all is the distance that we experience from God when we commit premarital sex or when we are drowning ourselves in sexual immorality. And so that's the first statement when Paul, when the people said everything is permissible. Paul was saying, yeah, everything is permissible but not everything is beneficial. Then he goes on to refute the second statement. Because the second statement goes, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. For the Corinthians, eating is a physical activity. And it has no bearing on one's spirituality. That was their mindset. Food simply goes into one's stomach. And then, with that logic, they equate that other physical activities do not affect a person's spirituality. And especially, promiscuity. It does not affect a person's spirituality. But for Paul, he denies that argument. He says that there is no parallel between these two statements. They are not the same. There, there is no similarity between eating and digesting food and practicing immorality. Eating affects the physical body, yes. So the spiritual, maybe not necessarily. But sexual immorality it negatively affects the spirit of a person. In an online article written in a website called The Theologia, okay, uh, authored by Lee Gattis, he had this to say about uh, premarital sex or sexual immorality. He wrote that sex is seen in the world's eyes in at least five ways. First of all, it is seen as being something essential, a natural instinct, or a need that is similar to food. Secondly, it is an experience, 
it is beneficial to accumulate as many different experiences as possible. That's what the world says. Third, it is an experiment. Compatibility can no longer be measured simply on the area of emotion, intellect, and uh, spirituality. Couples must be sexually compatible before they get married. Fourth, it is an expression. If two people really love each other, then it is natural to express that love through the act of sex. And then fifthly, it is regarded as entertainment. It is something free or fun, according to the world. But then Gattis goes on to refute all of these wrong views about sex. First of all, he said, it is not essential. You see, you are not less human if you, stick, you are still a virgin. You are very much human. Why? Because Jesus himself remained a virgin and he was a complete and fulfilled human being. You are not repressed if you patiently wait until marriage before sleeping with your spouse. There is nothing wrong with that. And so it is not essential. Second, it is not another experience. You know, we have experiences like, for example, uh, maybe we tried bungee jumping or scuba diving okay, or some other exciting thing. Those are experiences. But according to God, sex is not another experience that we add to our collection of experiences. It's more than that. And then third, it is not an experiment. Sex is too important to just be an experiment. And you don't need to engage in it to match your compatibility with someone. So there is no point in cohabiting or living in with someone. Fourth, uh, they say it's an expression. But there are better ways to express love to someone who we're not married to other than having sex. There are other ways. And then fifth, it is not entertainment. Don't misuse sex for mindless fun. If you want to entertain yourself, go do sports. Pick up a hobby or two. Okay. Go out with your friends and have good, clean fun. That is entertainment. Sex is not entertainment. So let's remember that not everything that the world endorses is morally acceptable. Especially when we're talking about this issue about sex outside of marriage. So please, let us reject the lie that the world is telling us about this subject. Because sex outside of marriage is always unacceptable in the eyes of God. Now in the passage, there's a second principle that we need to remember. And that is, our body is meant for the Lord's glory. Being members of the body of Christ, we are not to unite ourselves physically with someone who is not our spouse. When the Lord Jesus redeemed us, the act of redemption was not just something spiritual, but it is also one day a physical redemption. We were redeemed, not just so that we can go to heaven, but we have been redeemed so that we can begin to live a life that will glorify God. And this applies to our, not just to our spiritual body, but also to the physical body. And so we are to use our bodies with the aim that we are pleasing the Lord. We should not use our bodies as instruments for sinning. Because the body is not meant for sexual license. And we need to also remember that committing immorality is to form an unwanted union which would surely erode the relationship that we have with God. You see, our bodies were meant for the Lord and it's not meant for anyone else except for the person who is our husband or our wife. 
Therefore, we have to use our bodies to serve Him, to minister to Him, to do His will. You know, the Lord Jesus is the best model of how we can use our bodies to serve and to glorify God. If we read the Gospels, we know that He would use His hands to touch and to heal people. He used His mouth and His tongue to speak words of life. He used His feet to go to different places to proclaim the good news. To proclaim that there is deliverance for those who are in captivity to sin. Then we know that His body was tortured and hanged on the cross for our redemption. And so our bodies, these are meant for the Lord's use. And we should aim to bring glory to God with them. And so let us not give in to committing sexual sins because that is a distortion of God's purpose for our bodies. Thirdly, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, verse 19. You know, for a Jew, this image is very significant. It is because the temple was the place where God's presence dwelt in. If you remember the story uh, of Solomon when he completed the temple and when they were dedicating it to the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 8, what happened was that God's holy presence filled the temple in the form of a cloud. And so when Paul said that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, what he was saying was that God dwells not just in heaven, not just around us, but He dwells in us. And since our body is the dwelling place of God or the temple of the Holy Spirit, then it should never be used for sinning. All sins are grievous to God. But for Paul, sexual immorality is a terrible sin because it affects the body. It pollutes or desecrates the temple of God. Um, there was a time in history when the pagan king, Antiochus IV, he insulted the Jewish people when what he did was he stained the temple grounds with the blood of pigs. And then he erected a statue of the Greek god Zeus inside the Jewish temple. And so that's what desecration looks like in a physical sense. And so to give in to immorality is to desecrate that which rightly belongs to God. Therefore, we have to take care that we do not sin sexually because if we do, it is to stain, it is to desecrate the temple of God. Fourthly, God is the owner of our body, verse 20. We need to remember that God owns each one of us. You, you see, He acquired them that right when He bought us at a price. Although there is no mention in the passage what the price is, Many scholars and commentators agree that the price is none other than the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now before, Satan had dominion over us. And we would foolishly play into his lie when he made us think that we have ownership over ourselves. But now, because we have believed in Jesus Christ, we have followed him, God owns us. And so we need to recognize his ownership over us. And Paul here was, again, evoking a picture. It is the picture of a slave. A slave being purchased from another master. Once the purchase is completed, the slave is transferred to the new owner. And this slave must now transfer his loyalty to the new owner. And the old owner no longer has any say on the life of that slave. Maybe to help us understand this, because we don't live in a time of slavery, let's talk about employment. Let's say you work for a particular company. 
And then one day, someone approaches you and offers you, why don't you work for me? And he gives you a good package. And okay, you decided, okay, I'm going to resign from this company and I'm going to move to this new company. And so you move into this new company. So when you move there, there are a couple of things that you need to do. First of all, you have to remember that you no longer work for your old boss. And so what it means is, you have to learn to develop the new habits of the new company. You don't do things that the old company does. And then of course, if one day your old boss calls you, you don't answer to him in the sense that uh, you don't do anything for him for the sake of the company. No, because your employment is now with the new company. You don't work for your old boss. It's similar to like owning a car. You know, one day you go to a used car lot and you decide, oh, I see this nice car. I want to own a vintage Volkswagen. And so you bought the car. You negotiated with the owner, you got the car. Once payment has been made and the keys have been given to you and the deed of sale has been signed and notarized, the first owner has to relinquish all rights to the car. And he no longer can use the car as if it was his own. It's the same with us. We have a new master. We have a new owner. Satan used to be our master. But now, we should no longer call him our master. Nor do we call ourselves the masters of our lives. Instead, it is God. God is our master. He is our owner. We have to obey him. We have to do his bidding. We have to align to his plan and to his will for us. We should no longer listen to our old master. And we should no longer do what our old master wants for us to do. And then finally, we have to flee from sexual immorality. Thus far, we have heard three important truths that would guard us from committing sexual immorality. Then we heard earlier one command, and that is reject the worldly philosophies about sexual immorality. Now, these four points thus far have addressed the changing of our thinking and our perspective. The fifth point is what I would call as, uh, you know, the expression when the rubber hits the road. This is the practical point that we have to remember. Now all sins are grievous to God and of course we have to avoid them. But sexual immorality is unique as we said a moment ago because it's a sin against our own body. And it affects not just the body itself but even our spiritual and moral being. Now in this command to flee, there are two things I just want to highlight to you. First of all, we have to flee from committing the actual act of sexual immorality. This means that we should never ever be looking for an occasion to, to commit this sin with someone. Even if that person is a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And then of course we don't commit this sin because we want to experiment and have fun. What it means for us is maybe we have to avoid being with people being alone with someone of the opposite sex. Unless that person is your sibling or your parent. It means you must never go to places that promote promiscuity. Like maybe passing through an area called the red light district. The expression often used. Now, aside from fleeing from the actual doing of sexual immorality. We also have to flee from the things that gratify our minds. For example, the movies and the shows that we watch. We need to screen those. Then the books and magazines that we read. We have to be careful about that. And of course, the websites that we browse. 
we should not let anything infiltrate our minds as to influence it to desire for that which is wrong. So let us be accountable to someone who can check on us regarding this. Now, I like how Paul used the word flee. Flee simply means to run away from danger. That is the definition of the dictionary. Because the reason why we need to flee from sexual immorality is because it is something dangerous. Whether it is the act itself or the things that I allow into my mind to distort it. And so, when we talk about fleeing, remember this, especially when it's about sexual immorality. First of all is, do not negotiate with yourself, thinking that you can resist the temptation. And of course, secondly, do not compromise. You know, some people say that, okay, I can sin now and I know that later I can ask the Lord for forgiveness. That is a wrong and twisted mindset. Don't compromise, thinking that the Lord will forgive you anyway. The passage is clear. Flee. Just run away. Run away from sin. Run away from the temptation. Just like Joseph when he ran away from Potiphar's wife. So let us remember, flee from sexual immorality. In conclusion, the title this morning is Consecrate, not Desecrate. Now the word consecrate, according to the dictionary, it means to make or to declare something holy or sacred, or to dedicate something to a divine purpose. That is the meaning of consecrate. God has already bought us with a price. We already belong to Him. And each one of us have been made His temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the challenge for all of us this morning is, let us again dedicate our whole being to God. And this includes the physical body. Let us keep ourselves pure and free from the pollution of this world by refusing to indulge in immorality or to even entertain it in our minds. And let us not desecrate or treat with violent disrespect the body that we have because it is the dwelling place of God's spirit. Right now, let us ask everyone to just uh, close their eyes, bow their heads. And I want each one of us to make our own commitment again. That we will commit to be pure of heart, of mind, and even of our physical bodies. And also that we will commit that we will flee from temptation, we will flee from immorality. Let's make our own commitment right now. And afterwards, I will close my prayer. Father, right now we all come before you and we again commit ourselves to living a life of purity and holiness. Lord, the world wants to pressure us. The world wants to mold us such that the church, each one of us, would become like them. 
we pray, Lord, that we will not compromise and conform to this world, but instead enable us by your Holy Spirit to live a life that will please you. We once again dedicate our heart, our mind, and our bodies to you. May you use these, Lord, in order to bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.